we kind of sat here idle for a couple of years wondering what's next. Um, we have a little bit more regulatory clarity. We have some settlements that transpired with uh, Ripple and, and others. Um, we have more clarity on what to do and what not to do. Uh, bad guys are getting prosecuted. I think uh, FTX uh, prison sentences are getting handed down today sure. uh, for for Sam Bankman Freed. Um, and all of the gunslingers of the wild, wild west uh, during that time frame are getting weeded out. Uh, and I so I think you have this uh, wave happening um, right now that we're all benefiting from if you're in the market. And ultimately, we'll see probably a little bit of pullback and then we'll see uh, some more traction. Investors would like to know whether or not this Bitcoin rally that we've seen over the last few months is sustainable. Indeed, we've broken the previous all time high, but it's failed to really sustain above that level for a considerable amount of time. So what's next is the question on everyone's minds. Uh, helping us figure this out today is Kevin Maloney. He is the CEO of iTrust Capital. We'll be talking about not just the Bitcoin ETFs that have been launched, but also new ways to invest in Bitcoins that you may not have previously thought about. Kevin, welcome back to the show. It's good to have you back. David, good to see you. It's been, uh, I think, since November. Thanks for having us. <laughs> we uh, Our last interview aired on November 3rd. I don't have to tell you that a lot has happened to Bitcoin since November 3rd. In fact, um, I can put the link to our past discussion in the description down below. But Bitcoin was trading at exactly $33,000 when we aired our last interview. It's now more than double the price. So my first question is, tell us why it's rallied. I mean, the Bitcoin ETF is one narrative we're all familiar with. Is that it? No, I think there's other factors at play, David. And by the way, I went and looked at my cost basis for Bitcoin in my little I trust IRA account. And ironically, it is exactly at my basis, 33,000. Okay. So I don't know if I hung up and bought some then or bought some before. I certainly don't <laughs> make, I certainly don't make recommendations, but ironically, my basis is that the price on the day we spoke. But um I think there's a few factors at play. Obviously, we're all familiar with the exchange traded funds, the ETFs that got approved. Uh, obviously, that's a big major factor that allowed large institutions to participate in this space, uh, led by BlackRock and Fidelity, of course, big names. Uh, that's driving more curiosity. That's driving more awareness. It feels like more is just acceptable. More of the BTC digital asset exposure is just getting to be more acceptable. And I think you have the dormant factor. Uh, we kind of sat here idle for a couple of years wondering what's next. Um, we have a little bit more regulatory clarity. We have some settlements that transpired with uh, Ripple and, and others. Um, we have more clarity on what to do and what not to do. Uh, bad guys are getting prosecuted. I think uh, FTX uh, prison sentences are getting handed down today sure. uh, for, for Sam Bankman Freed. Um, and all of the gunslingers of the wild, wild west uh, during that time frame are getting weeded out. Uh, and I so I think you have this uh, wave happening um, right now that we're all benefiting from if you're in the market. And ultimately, we'll see probably a little bit of pullback and then we'll see uh, some more traction. So I'm looking at the price chart. Um, ever since 2024, the uh, NASDAQ is up. Uh, around 8.5%, 9%, depending on exactly which day you start. Bitcoin is up 66.7%, so 67% since the beginning of this year, Kevin. And if you just take a look at how the two uh, uh, lines have have uh, have moved, yes, Bitcoin has more or less followed the NASDAQ as it has historically done, but the NASDAQ has climbed more or less in a you know, in a, in a flat line, whereas Bitcoin has really shot up in a straight line and has oscillated on its own, which tells me just by looking at the charts that it's moved more or less for its own fundamental reasons and not so much followed the rest of the stock markets. Would you agree or disagree with what I just said? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think you have a lot more participation. I think a lot of people anticipated approvals uh, in that uh, Q4, Q1 time frame for ETFs. Um, there was a lot of pent up demand standing by. Uh, people were certainly curious. They wanted to participate. They allocated dollars. They felt safer doing it through the ETFs, which is a good uh, it's a good entry um, into the market. 
and uh, this demand is is playing out. You also have the having factor coming up here in April. That's going to change dynamics. We have an interest rate factor uh, that is going to change dynamics, likely the second half of this year. And so I think all that happening, regardless of global conflict and inflation and uh, debt, um, things like that happening around the globe and domestically, um, people are interested. They're placing dollars. Okay. Uh, I want to come back to a lot of the things that you mentioned, having interest rate cycle. Uh, but first, let's talk more about uh, this Bitcoin ETF. So if you were to look at, uh, first of all, if you, if you go on Google Trends, before we talk about the ETFs themselves, if you go on Google Trends and you type in the word Bitcoin or even crypto worldwide, the interest level is, well, it has been climbing, but it's still, it's still nowhere near its highs in 2021. So if you take a look at the index level of 100 back in 2021, it's currently at around 35.30, which tells me that even though the price has breached previous all-time highs, retail sentiment, or at least general interest in Bitcoin and cryptos, is not as high relative to two years ago, the previous all-time high. Could it be possible that most of the inflows into Bitcoin was institutional and not retail this year? Uh, certainly, it's, it's sort of part of my notes is that um, we, the mass, well, ultimately, the institutional dollars that are flowing in come from the working professionals around the country, right? Pension plans and institutions that are managing assets. I mean, there's a, there's some obviously corporate dollars, but yes, I think now the retail individuals through the institutions are now having access to this market. And I think that that's a phenomenal start. Being able to trade through your ETF 32 hours a week is a real exciting thing. I think some people will get sort of hooked on this, uh, this uh, they'll go beyond curiosity. They'll feel like they're in the game and then they're going to get really curious and figure out, want to figure out how to participate directly. But yes. And the short answer is massive institutional dollars flowing. And I think we're just, we are just at the peak of the, we are just at the tip of the iceberg. I think there's a lot more dollars to flow into the market to uh, satisfy the curiosity, satisfy the demand. And by the way, you know, you hit on some big numbers up 66% this year alone, number one, you know, one top performing asset class. Now, is that sustainable? Probably not. Is it going to go on forever? Absolutely not. Should we bet the farm? No, uh, we're not making recommendations. This is all people making their own decisions, but it is exciting. We sat dormant, things are turning around. And I do think regardless of where we are now, even if you and I are up a little bit on the yeah. BTC positions we hold, um, there's always going to be a correction. I don't know if it's 10 to 30%, but there's always going to be corrections. Well, that's a very realistic viewpoint. Thank you for your honesty. But why do you think we're going to get a correction? I mean, why aren't you a Bitcoin diehard uh, maximalist who thinks it's just going to go up in a straight line? I I believe over time there's massive opportunity for uh for you know room for growth from here. If you look at the having factor, which bakes basically uh, um, the miners are going to get paid half what they were getting paid for doing the same amount of work starting mid to late April, right? That's just a fact. There's 29 other havings scheduled in the algorithms for this. Uh, for this asset, Bitcoin, right? So we're going to get a halving. It happens every four years. There's a certain cycle, 500 days after the halving, you know, things go well, generally peaks out. We get a little pullback. But again, there's another halving and another halving after that. What that means is they don't cut the the, the Bitcoin half and, you know, price in half. They, um, you know, two things. Fortunately, BTC is capped at 21 million, right? So Bitcoin is capped at 21 million. We will not issue any more than 21 million. A lot of people may not understand that. Some people say we can just issue more shares like the government prints dollars. No, it's capped at 21 million. Also, every four years, and I believe there's 29 ahead of us, there will be a halving, which means every time there's a hash or another block in the chain, a solution is provided and we add another block in the chain, um, You know, the Bitcoin miners are mining currently about 900 Bitcoin a day. That's gonna go to 450. So they're gonna get half the amount of Bitcoin for doing the same amount of work, right? So we get a, not only do we have a capped finite amount of Bitcoin available, the supply, the availability of it gets more sparse as well. Ultimately over time, if the curiosity is there and the dollars are flowing in, we're gonna see 
a, 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 you know, what I believe could be a really phenomenal uh, upside potential for this asset. Now, I'm talking over the next 10 years, this thing, yes, I do believe it'll continue to grow. But every uh, every period we get a new high, uh, we do see pullbacks. I'm just looking at history, right? I don't report the future. I just look at the history. And um, so that's that's kind of a little bit of, of, of my thought process there. Well, naysayers would say that this is the biggest bubble ever. It was the biggest bubble two years ago. Now it's, a, you know, now it's once again the biggest bubble ever, primarily because Bitcoin doesn't do anything. It doesn't on its own generate any yield or cash flow. It has no utility and therefore its intrinsic value is zero. This is an old narrative that we've heard for several years, but it's obviously repopulating now as Bitcoin is nearing $71,000 as we speak today. How would you respond to that? Yep. Don't bet the farm. Um, you know, diversify your holdings. Uh, there are some valid points there. However, um, I think this starts to take the place, not replace, but just starts to chip into basically what feels like holding gold, right? Um, some people may hold gold. Um, they like the physical, the touch, the feel. Uh, there's value there. I think this is uh, something that'll chip away at uh, those that like to hold gold as uh, something that will hold value. The value is determined by how many people are willing to accept it. Right now, globally, there's a lot of people willing to accept the value of Bitcoin. Uh, I don't think it becomes a, an international uh, currency. I think it is a storage place for, for assets. And I think it grows over time. Again, it's capped at a certain amount. It's going to become more finite every few years when the halving continues to occur. 29 ahead of us. This is only our third, I believe, coming up. And uh, so it's going to get more difficult. I think it's going to get more expensive. And I think it becomes because it's tradable and I don't have to store it in my trunk or my safe or in the basement or under my bed. Um, I think it's just easier to move around. And I think the younger people and older people that are curious are starting to participate. And this is just Bitcoin, by the way. Now, we know it's the number one asset class in this space, but there are other platforms that are doing phenomenal things that could disrupt you know, industries uh, from a blockchain perspective as well. But this one, like you said, no utility, no cash flow, uh, not backed by assets. Uh, I still think it's attracted to millions of people, as you can see. Well, Bitcoin as an asset, how could it evolve in its utility? In other words, beyond just speculation and gambling and investing, what other use cases could there be for not just the layer twos and layer threes being built on, but the layer one itself? Well, Bitcoin alone, I mean, it's it's pretty limited, right? There's not a lot you can program from it. It's 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 set it and forget it uh, as far as the way it was designed and built. There's some phenomenal uh, features to it. But right now it's a digital it's a digital currency. It's something you can move around and store and and uh, people are betting on the upside. The other platforms, layer one and two, for example, by the way, 30 percent of our volume right now is Bitcoin. Most people are transacting, buying and selling in Bitcoin in their uh, self-directed IRAs on the iTrust platform. However, we've seen Solana, for example, uh, we're seeing a lot of coins, uh, some meme coins, some utility tokens be built off the Solana platform. That's gaining traction. Last year when we spoke, it was about 5% of our volume. Today, it's 12 to 13%. That's nearly double. AVAX also, Avalanche. Um, that there, there are lots of um, you know, protocols and foundations being built off those platforms as well. So from a true utility perspective, we think, uh, I think this is just me speaking personally, that there are other things like Ethereum and Solana and AVAX to look at as far as true utility. Can't guarantee any upside, not saying go buy them now. Um, but those are really interesting from a program, uh, a programmable um, contract perspective. And I also look at how many coins are being launched, what other things are being built off other platforms. It's kind of like owning a patent. If you want to keep patent out there, how many people are mentioning your patent and their patent? They need this technology to bring their product to market. And right now, that's a key feature. How many people are mentioning other platforms that they're building on? And I see growth in those other areas outside of Bitcoin, of course. One thing that isn't talked about as much is companies adding Bitcoins to their treasuries. Is there an advantage for companies to do that? Uh, recently, a well, couple months ago, FASB changed their accounting rules so that changes in, fair amount, uh, changes in the fair value of Bitcoin can now be reported in your net income. Um, Previously, it was only a, a cost to impairment. So basically, if Bitcoin goes down, you have to, you know, note note the impairment, but you can't report uh, the gains in fair value. But now you can. 
does that provide enough of an incentive to for companies to start holding more Bitcoin on their balance sheet? Well, I know uh, it's a great question. I know a lot of companies currently looking at there are several that I know of that are are you know dabbling and dollar cost averaging and holding some crypto on the company's balance sheet, not commingling that with client assets. Um, there are a lot of companies looking at that. I think. Um, Look, if you're a long-term believer and you believe this thing's going up like real estate or equities over the, la over the next five to 10 years, there will be hiccups. It will not be a straight line. It never is. Um, I see a lot and I can understand why companies would consider adding uh, a responsible amount. They have to figure out the percentage. I don't know if that's one to 10% exposure, but they companies need to figure out what percent of exposure they would want on their balance sheet. Uh, and it could be a hedge, right? It could be a hedge. This thing may uh, do a double or a triple from here. Uh, it could 10 X, it could go back down to 15,000. We don't know, but some companies are looking at it as a hedge uh, to some of their uh, cash management strategies. I see. Okay. But it's not a form of payment for some of these companies. I mean, it could be, I, I've just noticed that over the last couple of years, um, uh, Things like Tether, right? Stable coins have become more popular as a form of payment, whereas be before the advent of stable coins, Bitcoin was a predominant method of B2B transactions. Uh, that's kind of shifted, right? So how do you see that for yeah. you play playing out? You know, look, for us, it, it, we don't currently have any crypto on our balance sheet, but it, it, it wouldn't be for payment strategy. It would be for uh, as a hedge to some of the uh, things we're thinking about from a business perspective. Um, but yeah, right now, I mean, look, there's some stable coins that might have potential issues when we were having the banking issues last year. People thought, uh, you know, one or two of the stable coins might have some issues and and could implode. Um Right now, Bitcoin's more widely accepted and trusted as that as an asset that is tradable, and it is just storing uh, value right now. But but do you see Bitcoin having a future as a form of payment in a world of um, you know stablecoin dominance in that field? I mean, certainly we've seen countries adopt this. El Salvador has made a legal tender, so you could buy your coffee with Bitcoin. I'm not sure if you would want to, but you could. So I mean, is there a future for Bitcoin? I think uh, there certainly could be a future. I think it ultimately becomes more of a store of a, a store of value. Look, if you if you look at Ray Dalio's principles and the 500 year cycles that he's analyzed and who becomes the predominant player and what currency is used and who controls the waterways and strength of militaries, there's a lot of factors there. It'd be hard for me to kind of predict that. I know you're not asking for a crystal ball, but look, it it can be transferred easily with very little to no fees. Uh, to make payments to people. Right now, I think people are storing cash in the form of crypto, like they're doing gold as a hedge and as an opportunity to ride the wave if it continues to grow. I do think there will be some hiccups in the market. It's not going to be smooth sailing from here. That's why we always say don't bet the farm. It's all up to the individual and the risk they want to take. But um, it's not going away. It is very interesting. The use cases for the other... Um, uh, utility tokens are becoming quite compelling and the amount of people building off these other large platforms some of the other names i mentioned those aren't recommendations but those are just what i'm seeing in the news uh is is really interesting um I, and so we're watching carefully um we're we're just uh we're not necessarily a market participant we are a market uh, we are enabling people to participate in, in the blockchain economy if there's interest I do want to talk about iTrust uh, and what exactly you do in just a minute. But first, let's go back to a few of the market uh, forces that you mentioned uh, previously that we haven't addressed yet. So having, we talked, you, you mentioned having, what do you anticipate is going to happen post having? Let, let, actually, let me rephrase that question. Do you think um, the price of Bitcoin is already baked, is already factoring in the having? In other words, you know, the event sure, is baked sure, into the price? Think, yeah. Short answer, yes. I do think it is uh, sort of baked in, just like we saw run up before the ETFs. I think that was there was some baked in pricing there. Um, you get a little bit of run up. There's a lot of speculation, anticipation, and then it happens and people take a breath. They exhale and it comes back a little bit. Okay, I'm in. Now what? Right? Okay, well, who's going to drive the next wave? Um, I do think the price is, is baked in right now for having. I do not think it's going to double quickly from here. Uh, I think we might even see a pullback of, you know, excuse me, um, five to 15%. Um, so that's just my own conjecture, uh, you know, and I don't know what time frame. I think we'll, we will pull back. And if it does pull back, I, I selfishly hope it does a little bit. I'd like to put a little bit more in myself. 
uh, in that. I wish <laughs> I your dollar cost the average is going to be higher after this interview. Hey, it's going to be like forty five thousand dollars or something like that. Yeah, it's going to crush my basis. Last yeah. time we talked, I bought Bitcoin, uh, you know, um, uh, soon thereafter at, at the around the price we talked in November. And yeah, I didn't have a ton uh, of exposure. I still don't. Um, but but I'm in because I'm curious and interested and I want to be part of um, this this uh, part of the story well, and the journey. At least uh, but, you're, price, yeah, at least you're somewhat price sensitive. I've heard I've interviewed a lot of people in the Bitcoin space. I've heard this before from several people. I don't care what the price of Bitcoin is. I'll buy it at any level. $10, $10,000, $100,000, because Bitcoin's going to 10 million one day. So what does it matter if I'm buying it at $10,000 or $100,000, right? I've heard that narrative before. Yeah, yeah. No, look, I mean, uh, there are some diehard fanaticals out there and uh, more power to them. They might be driving a little bit of the market. I, I'm more of a, you know, I have traditional finance background. I'm more of a dollar cost averaging guy. Don't bet the farm. Dip your toe in the water. If you get a pullback and you're excited and you have capital and it's, uh, getting allocated to higher risk, uh, speculative um, things like this, then yeah, I mean it, it could make sense. Um, you know, I I I, ho I don't hope it drops below thirty three thousand so that I can get in uh, there. But I I do think we're going to constantly see some run ups, some pullbacks, and then there's other factors that we're going to hit on. You know, in this conversation that that will drive some things that beyond our control. You mentioned interest rates. That's the other. That's the other factor. Is there a relationship, a clear relationship between Bitcoin and interest rates? No, nah, not that people. I mean, you know, people say there's an, you know, there was at one point a, a contrarian viewpoints and and there was an inverse relationship between interest rates and Bitcoin and the markets and Bitcoin. I don't know. There's there's uh, you look at the correlation. It's 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 things are getting a little bit more correlated, it, it seems. Well, um, well, generally speaking, if the Fed pivots, which people expect them to do, which is to say they cut rates later this year, would that be a positive or a negative for Bitcoin? I think ultimately it becomes a positive for, for, you know, assets across the board. I don't think it's just Bitcoin. Okay. Um, I, I, I you know, certainly they plan to, you know, again, that no guarantees, but they, they certainly plan to look at making a couple cuts this year. And I, I think that helps things uh, uh, along the narrative of, okay, maybe we are coming out of this inflation in a good place. Uh, you know, things like that. And people will feel more comfortable about putting, there's still a lot of cash on the sidelines. Right. There's still people that don't believe or understand any digital assets. And uh, but, you know, there are some factors that I think will continue to contribute, even if I'm wrong, even if we don't get a pullback as institutions, as we get more regulatory clarity, people are more compliant. They're more transparent. It feels like um, uh, safer to participate, not in the asset class, meaning it's not going to go down. But the the gateway, the individual company that getting me there isn't going to, um, you know, um, you know, uh, do anything nefarious. Dollars are going to flow in. OK, uh, ETF inflows continue to skyrocket. Just one example. This came in today on the 28th of March. ARK21 shares BT, uh, Bitcoin ETF hits 200 million daily inflows for the first time. Um, as Bitcoin T seventy two thousand dollars a coin. Uh, why ETFs? First of all, I mean, what 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 does an ETF provide as an investment vehicle that the spot cannot? Okay, well, yeah, I mean that's a big number. Um, you know, uh, BlackRock and and Fidelity this week. Um, gosh, uh, they kind of swapped places. Fidelity was number one for a while. They brought in two hundred million on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, Fidelity brought in 540.9 million. So massive inflows. Why is that happening? I think the general public is getting more, the, the curious people that were already curious and standing by are starting to participate. The ETFs, obviously um, not a guarantee in performance at all, but the ETFs are regulated, are, uh, are offered through a regulated you know, financial entity, and that all feels safer as well. Uh, now there's multiple fees and 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 things like that. You have to understand sort of what the fee structures are. But um, ultimately, um, you know, um, grayscale fees uh, were a little bit higher. Dollars flew into a little bit to chase lower fee structured items. Uh, you know, you got the fee factor. You got the competition factor. You got the fact that it's a regulated entity uh, approved by the SEC, meaning they don't approve and are not recommending the uh, asset class, but it's available now on a regulated exchange. And that just feels uh, more compliant. It feels like it's a little bit safer. It feels like the bad guys aren't going to take my money. 
I think from here it grows. And now while people are dipping their toe in the water and getting exposure through billions of dollars a week through the top 10, 11 players that were approved in January, I think the, the fanaticals are already directly invested. I think the people through um, that are curiously participating, placing a few dollars because they want to be part of the story are going to want eventually direct access. The ETFs are great. They're regulated, they're, they're entities, but they're going to want direct access. At some point, they're going to open up an account with an exchange or an IRA platform like ours and buy direct. And at some point, they're going to want to say, wow, this thing moves a lot around the clock. They may wake up at two in the morning, see some big growth, making a, a trade in their IRA account. Uh, depending on your, you know, your situation, there may be tax advantages to doing that. Uh, I mean, imagine going direct and trading on a Sunday afternoon while people are watching an MLB baseball game or a golf tournament, right? You can't do that through the ETFs. It's not a slide against them. It's a great start. It's a gateway to get people into digital assets. I think they're going to want to own BTC Direct. Sure. Then I think they're going to want to look at other other things. Probably not as many as the meme coins, but they're going to want to participate there as well. <laughs> okay. Well, t tell us about uh, iTrust, but more generally speaking, why do we need an IRA? What's Why can't they just put my Bitcoin in a wallet and leave it alone until I retire? Yeah. So you can. You can buy direct through some exchanges like you know Coinbase, Kraken, Crypto.com. Um, you, you name it. There's a few out there that you can buy direct. You can you can open up a wallet, fund it with your bank account, some a credit card, I believe, and you can buy direct through those exchanges. We are not an exchange. We're a software platform. We work with liquidity providers. We work with a qualified custodian, uh, which is a regulated entity that custodies your cash and crypto assets. That's important because it means iTrust Capital does not ever touch or hold your crypto or cash. It's never on our balance sheet. It's never commingled with our own cash that we pay our bills with. It is separate in their name, FBO for the benefit of the, of the client uh, at these custodians, these qualified custodians. That's really important. We want to, we're launching other products and services with that qualified custodian wrapper. You get transparency, you get access to information, you get access to our client service team, and you get access to open up an account for your IRA, an individual retirement account for the working professionals across America. That means, depending on your situation, there may be some tax advantages to owning digital assets in your IRA. And long term, if we get some upside, there's tax benefit. And if you buy and sell and trade within your uh, IRA account, it's also, um, depending on your situation, it, there are tax benefits. And so that's, that's, you know, I trust capital. We've been around five years. We've got 200,000 people that have signed up on our platform over 51,000 are, are active and, 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 uh, uh, you know, put in uh, traded nearly $9 billion. And, uh, we've got uh, several billion dollars on the platform. Again, we're the software platform, we're the dashboard, and we work with all of the regulated, regulated entities, the institutional storage providers that store your crypto, the FDIC insured banks that store the crypto, uh, that store the cash, and the liquidity providers that exchange the cash and execute the trade to get your, your crypto in your account. Um, so it's something we innovated on um, five years ago. We're leading the industry on transparency, uh, and we also pride ourselves on client service. When you call us, we pick up the phone, and there's a big difference there. Here's a comment left on our last video when you came on the show in late October. It says, and like your address is, why would I trust a company that won't let me hold a set of keys to my BTC I don't trust? Can you address that? Yeah, sure. And there are a lot of people that are, you know, not my keys, not my crypto. They want to own the keys and they own the crypto. And those people absolutely have that option through other uh, entities. We work with BitGo and uh, Fireblocks, and we have uh, uh, multiple firms that help us back up the keys to these exchanges. So if anything happens to iTrust, if anything happens to the custodian, there are multiple ways to get these keys. I don't have anybody's keys. They hold, basically when they log in one piece, the another entity holds another piece, they get matched up and people get access. But it's not, um, it's not FDIC secured, I'm guessing. Like, let's say the company goes under, people still get their Bitcoins? Yes, if, if for example, our qualified custodian the regulated trust company that is the custod the custodian of record 
if, for example, they imploded, they went down, they went into receivership. Even if we imploded, we went down, we went into bankruptcy. The state steps in, the regulators step in and look at the subledgered account. And David Lynn, Kevin Maloney have this much Bitcoin in storage at this facility, and it is all accounted for. We reconcile every day. We don't take any of your crypto, our clients' crypto, my crypto, commingle it. Uh, with anything corporate. It's all held separate, subledgered in their name. So if anything happened to iTrust, great question, or the qualified custodian, like I said, state steps in and says, this is your cash, this is your crypto. We like that approach. If you're doing it by the book and you're uh, compliant and transparent, and um, you know it's 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 what we think, it's what we spoke to the commissioner about. Hester Purse visited our office, SEC commissioner back in February at our invitation. Um, to talk about transparency, ethics, you know, access, client service, safety, security, peace of mind. We covered all those topics. And um, we would like to see more of this approach happen. Qualified custodian, regulated financial entity wrapper around individual assets held either in cash uh, or crypto, uh, in taxable or, or non-taxable accounts, so that if anybody is nefarious or does anything wrong, uh, or the companies disappear, state steps in and your assets are spoken for. That's really key. A lot of people don't realize that. If you lose your own key or or uh, access uh, in your safe or your, if it's not in your safe or your safety deposit box, look, that's a one-time deal. You can't get back in. Um, I don't, we don't want to risk that for our clients. Yeah. Well, you mentioned you don't commingle your client's funds with other use cases that are not just cust you know, custodying your client's funds. Uh, the question everybody has now that after the FTX debacle is how do we know? How do we know that these funds have been audited or that there's a Pope and Ledger or you know some sort of accounting system that we can trust? Yeah. Um, so number one, um, audited by uh, third parties, which is key. Uh, number two, we um, check our records daily with the records of the qualified custodian. We make sure that our qualified custodian record, uh, our qualified custodian has our records reflecting what our clients hold on their dashboard, and we have viewing access to make sure theirs uh, as well. On top of that, we've been in discussions and we are launching a program that will offer more transparency and access so that in the future, we can work with uh, an audit firm to log in at any time and spot check our crypto and our wallets or our bank accounts, only viewing access to confirm the cash and the crypto match what our clients believe they have on their dashboard. To my knowledge, there's not a lot of people, if anyone, doing this at that at that scale. Now, an annual audit is great. A quarterly audit is great. But you can change stuff the next day. We know that. We want an audit firm to work with us, powered by such and such audit firm, verified by such and such audit firm. We want them to know that we have nothing to hide. We're fully transparent, that they can log in and see the cash or crypto. Can't buy, sell, trade, or move it. But they can see and verify A and B. Uh, dashboard versus uh, what's what's actually available in the bank or in our Fireblocks wallets. That's really key. And we're working on the ability to do that, uh, not because it's recommended or mandated. We want to do that because A, no one else is, and B, we think people will appreciate that uh, because C, given what we've gone through the last two years, nefarious activity, gunslingers, wild, wild west, um, there will always be bad players in any market, let's be clear. A lot of it's been weeded out. We're going to see some strict sentences handed down to people. Um, those are always deterrents for a short time. People then forget, get greedy again. But ultimately, we're a bunch of boring traditional finance guys. Uh, my background is a compliance officer at PIMCO. You know, look, I started with rules and regulations. It'll always be part of our story, and we spend millions trying to get it right. So we're not going to cut corners. Um, but it doesn't matter what I say. The auditors that we want to partner with will verify positions for us at our request. How, how many coins are currently being offered on iTrust? Uh, right now, I believe we have about 35. Uh, obviously, that's led by Bitcoin and Ethereum. Those are the majority. And then we have a couple of utility tokens, like I mentioned, the analogy of, that are getting mentioned as uh, being used in lots of other patents and technologies, right? So uh, that's that's sometimes the value of a patent can be determined by how many times it's mentioned in another patent. What's Again, next? an analogy. But yeah, what's next for the company? Any developments we should be uh, aware of? 
Yeah, we're looking at uh, launching some what we think are some exciting products and services uh, over the next six months. Stay tuned. I'm not naming the names of those or or what what those can do for the clients, but we've done some surveys. We do a couple surveys a year with our uh, 50,000 active clients and overwhelmingly people are uh, encouraged and um, encouraging us to launch additional products and services. The beauty of having a big active base uh, is we can engage them and say, what do you like? What do you not like? What should we be thinking about? What other coins can we add? What other asset classes are you interested in? And we look carefully and we try to iterate quickly based on that feedback after we make sure that it's legal, compliant, and the structure makes sense. So we're evaluating some good products and services. Um, also in the future, just one more thought is the client service side. We've expanded our group. We've hired 25 new people this year alone just to take on the demand for client service. Why? Well, it just feels more comfortable when a company picks up the phone uh, after uh, um, a short wait in the queue to sp speak to a voice in the US about my crypto. And if you're new or curious and you're a working professional like me, age 40 to 60, and you want to participate with a company and you're thinking about giving them a small percentage of your retirement or allocating some towards crypto, go with a company that is transparent. Go with the company that will pick up the phone and, and or respond to your email. We're taking thousands of calls and emails weekly. We pick up the phone with a smile. We're available to answer questions. We're not here to sell, recommend anything. We don't have any sales consultants. We don't pay commissions to our people. We're here to listen and solve problems and give access. And I think that is a differentiator that's been benefiting the company. When you give good client service and you don't overcharge and you give people access and you give people transparency and you give people access to educational tools and you're acting in a compliant manner, for example, inviting the SEC commissioner into your office, we're not even regulated by them, but we had really good, healthy, productive conversations about what what's on their radar, what we can do to help them, what they can do to help us and what we're doing that can just push forward uh, to set an example in the industry. We're one of the bigger players out there. And so we need to set a good example of doing the right thing. So, you know, that and a good qualified custodian partner, the trust company of, of record is key. That is the business. If you get those right, you can build a nice little business that we believe will continue to grow over time. But the key is the clients. The clients need access and they want to feel safe and secure. Okay, well, you can learn more about iTrust Capital down in the link below. I'll put the uh, uh, link where you can find out more information. Thank you very much, Kevin. We'll speak again soon when there's, uh, when there's an update on either iTrust or the markets. David, good to see you. Uh, it's been since November, the first time, and uh, we'll see in the next six months. Uh, do we double from here or is it half? I don't know. Um, final, it'll, final, it'll fi final question for you. Um, you don't have to answer it. Are you buying more Bitcoin as soon as this interview ends? <laughs> As soon as which, which happens? As soon as this interview ends, are you going to go buy more Bitcoin? <laughs> I'm going to uh, dollar cost average in over, the next, <laughs> over the next 90 days uh, because I don't know what's going to happen after the halving. But sure. I am going to continue to, to buy some more. But of course, for everyone out there, not betting the farm. <laughs> oh, absolutely. All right. Thank you very much, Kevin. See you soon. Thank you, David. Good to see you. Have a good day. Yeah. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.